All right. And today we're going to finish off our series called The Big Four, talking about the most important things in life. My hope would be for our church here at City Life Church in San Francisco that when people ask us, like, hey, so that church that you got baptized at, well, like, what's that church all about? Really, we're all about Jesus. That's, that's the most important name. That's the only name that really matters here. The pastor's names don't really matter. Jesus is the most important reason why we're here. That's why we sing the song, nothing else matters. That's true. But then there's four things that for us are extremely important. I say the four most important things in life, and that's why we've preached this series. Number one, we want people to know God. There's a lot of people that know about God, but they don't know God for real. They've heard of God. They read about God on their dollar bill, but they don't know God personally. Epigonosco was the Greek word that we, that we explore together. There's, there's knowledge, which is nosco or gnosko, and then epigonosco, the Greek word that means to know God personally. I was watching TV the other day, and Jaden was watching TV with Dad, and one of the athletes made this amazing move, and he goes, Dad, that was epic gnosko. That was phenomenal, <laughs> and uh, it's supposed to be funny. Thank you, Sarah, for the laugh. I appreciate that. And um, God wants you and I to know him personally. Then we talked about finding freedom. Freedom is a choice. I use the example of lobsters who are caught in these traps, and freedom is one foot away, but they can't crawl out of their cage. God's made freedom available to all of us. We have the choice to respond to him. He will never force his will on you, but he invites you to have that thriving relationship that brings with it freedom. So freedom is available. We want you to find your freedom in God here. Amen. Pastor Keys last week then preached on discovering purpose, and today I'm going to continue the series talking about making a difference. God wants you and I to make a difference. By the way, last week I, I ministered up in Washington State at the city of Walla Walla. Have you ever heard of Walla Walla before? Great place. I fell in love with the city. More importantly, I fell in love with the church, Life Church with pastors Bob and Kara Grimm. Phenomenal church. Their worship team was just amazing. All of their ministries, their men's ministry was just ridiculous, just incredible. They put on a phenomenal men's retreat. And so now we have some new friends City Life Church has Life Church friends all the way up in Walla Walla, Washington. I can't wait to bring some of the, the leaders down to come and, and pour into our team here. It's going to be amazing. So, uh, divine appointment. Thank you for all of your prayers. And can you believe that Monday the world didn't come to an end? I know we all had our little glasses and we're looking at the eclipse. Overrated. You know, it's like, man, we looked at that thing and it was gone just like that. And so, for those of you who are praying for, for uh, the end of the world, we're still here. <laughs> But uh, we're going to continue to, to preach from the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, go to the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, someone says, say what? <laughs> Ecclesi what now? Ecclesiastes. That's in the Old Testament. Praise God for our uh, Bibles on the phone. It helps us find the books real quickly. Ecclesiastes is where we're going to launch from today, chapter 3. All of our notes from today's sermons are available uh, through version. So if you, if you want my notes on your phone or your device, just text CLC Notes to 97,000, and everything I'm preaching from will go right to your phone, and you can kind of flow with me. But Ecclesiastes, this is what the writer says. It, it, it skips a little bit and goes on to say, And God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. God created everything. And it's amazing because the Bible tells us that we were created in the image of God. Humanity, humans, we were created like God. God is three parts, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and He created you and I with three parts, a spirit, a soul, and a physical body. We were created in the image of God to have a relationship with Him, like a father with a son or a daughter. We're the only creatures on this planet that actually have a spirit. Someone just asked, asked me this week, uh, like animals, do pets have a soul? I'm like, well, the Bible doesn't specify exactly if they have a soul, but as I, as I learned it, um, the soul contains one's mind, will, and emotions. So um, I remember when I was a kid, I had a dog, and whenever we'd come home and start wagging its tail, <laughs> you know, do his little thing, he'd get excited. And it's like, he was happy. And when we would leave, he'd like, woo, woo, woo. I'm like, he had emotions. And then when I read from Jesus, when, he, when it says that this man was filled with demons, and, and, and Jesus is about to set this man free, and the demons interact with Jesus and ask them, ask Jesus, will you, will you send us to those pigs? And the Bible says that they went and they entered the pigs and the pigs were driven off of a cliff. So what, do they, what does that mean that they entered a, uh, uh, the pigs? I, I believe that the animal kingdom does have a soul realm, not a spirit realm, though. We're the only creatures that were created in the image of God with a soul and a spirit. So that sets us apart from everyone else. Someone just right now cringed and said, oh, my gosh. <laughs> This last thing, I get to go to heaven then? I've been praying for her salvation. Now what? Adios mio. 
um, look, if it's that important to you, if God knows that, man, Lassie is that special and dear to you, who knows? Maybe he'll just allow our pets to, to make it there someday. Honestly, we won't really care when we make it to heaven, but I'm just bringing some comfort to some of you who just cringe right there. But this verse, it says that God placed eternity within all of us. It doesn't matter if you're a faith person. It doesn't matter if you're an atheist. Don't believe that there is a God or maybe agnostic where you believe a even if there was a God, there's no really a way that we would find out how to connect. Regardless of your faith stance, the fact is, according to Scripture, God created us in His image, and He placed a sense of eternity within all of us. Understanding this, that we don't live life just to get through another day, just to get through another season. Life for us goes beyond this dimension. That's why when we do memorial services or funerals, people have to come to this awareness that, you know what, there's more to life than just this. And it's sad sometimes when we go to these memorial services, and Pastor Keys just did one recently, where you have to just kind of slow down and ponder and think of eternity. Life is much longer than just this physical dimension that we live in right now. We all have a starting point, but listen to this. The Bible tells us that we were created as eternal beings. We have a starting point, but there is no finishing point. We continue to live, someone say, forever. We live forever. Our life continues to exist beyond this physical dimension. That's why it's so stinking important to understand. Look, the decisions that we make on, on, on this dimension right now, they have eternal, 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 eternal. They have eternal ramifications. The decisions that we make now have eternal consequences. And the Bible teaches us that beyond this life, when this physical world is done, there's going to be one of two destinations. Either you're going to be in the presence of God forever, or you're going to be separated from God forever. And that's what the Bible refers to as hell, a place of damnation. That's where Lucifer and all the fallen angels, that's where all the evil things, that's where they go. That's why we're so motivated to tell people about the love of God and say, you don't have to be distant from God. You too can have a relationship with God. Not only so you can live a thriving life here on earth now, but so that you can spend eternity with God forever. That's why we're motivated. The reason we live is to be light bearers, those that share the good news with the world around us. And that's the conversation that we're going to have today, talking about not only do we discover purpose and why we're here, but then God challenges us to make a difference. So that's where we're going today. So if you're taking notes, um, be sure to uh, 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 circle some of these verses in your notes because they, they should stick with us. The great prophet Abraham Lincoln he said, there's a quote, he's not a prophet, right, president. He said, surely God would not have created such a being as man to exist only for a day. No, no, man was made for immortality. Even this ancient figure of ours, he, he makes this profound statement. We were created for eternity, immortality, in the sense that God has placed a touch of heaven into each one of us. Life is precious. Life is significant. By the way, we're in San Francisco where, to me, it's, it's just the way that the world thinks. It's amazing how much of our resources, money, energies, and legislation, how much is applied towards nature. And I, I believe in preserving nature. Bear with me here. Don't, don't lose your salvation right here. But, I mean, in my books, life, human life is more important than some whale that's in extinction. Human life is more important than some little toad at some little pond down the street somewhere. I mean, I appreciate nature, but human life is way more important than that. And some little frog that's like, oh my gosh, they're about ready to cease to exist. I get it. And we should try to preserve nature, but life is more important. It's amazing. What if we directed half of the energy, not let alone 100%, but 50%, if we directed 50% of our, of our uh, resources, finances, care, services towards caring for the poor of our own city, what would happen? What would change in our nation? Where we spend billions of dollars on things that, you know what, I mean, they're nice, but people are much more important. They're much more precious than just that. It's amazing how there's, 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 there's this instinct within humans to survive. Where all of a sudden, maybe, maybe you've experienced this, where you pull up to all of a sudden uh, a, a car accident. Maybe you've, you've witnessed it where something happened, poof, and maybe you've watched this on Facebook or YouTube, and all of a sudden complete strangers who don't know this person, Maybe they just came back from the mall. They're wearing some expensive clothes or whatever. They forget everything else. They don't care what color skin the person has or whatever. They run to try to save someone and pull out. I've seen that on TV before. Maybe that's, maybe that's happened to you. It's happened to me. 
where we don't even care if we get bloodied or dirtied or whatever. We're trying to save another person. God created us with this instinct for survival. He created us with an instinct to have a relationship with him. Eternity is in our hearts. That should drive us. That should be a value of all of us. To have an indifferent heart towards other people, to have this callousness and like, ah, oh, that person's drowning, I don't care. That is evil. That's demonic. That's not of God. Am I preaching to somebody here? And being that, hey, I'm already on this pony right now, talking about current events, thank God people didn't come to San Francisco yesterday disguising it as a prayer to bring hate into our city. Here in our city, we reject hate. We embrace the love of God. We will stand for righteousness. We will always stand for the peace of God. We will stand for the love of God. God's love wins. So whatever we got to do, I'll be on the front lines with our team saying, we don't want hate here. We reject hate. You ain't bringing that racist attitude into our city. That ain't going to happen. Come on, somebody. Am I preaching to our church? <laughs> Eternity is in our hearts. God created us in his image. So Galatians, Paul talks to the church in Galatia, and he says this. Galatians 3, verse 26, he says, For you are the children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And it goes on, verse 29, And now that you belong to Christ, listen, you don't belong to yourself no more. When you made that exchange, your life doesn't belong to you no more. You belong to Christ. Now that you belong to Christ, he says, You are the true children of Abraham. And you're like, but wait a minute, I thought I was a children of God. Who is Abraham? Who is this dude? I'll expand just one second. He goes, You are heirs in God's promise to Abraham. Or in his promise, God's promise to Abraham, it belongs to you. You're like, Sue's Abraham. Who is this guy? Abraham was this character in the Old Testament when the world was still kind of unpopulated. There weren't millions or billions of people yet. God selected this man by the name of Abram at the time. He says, I'm going to show kindness to you. I'm going to call you to leave the land of your father, your family. I'm going to lead you into a new place. And I'm going to bless you. And as we study the life of, uh, of Abraham in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, you pick it up from, uh, from chapter 12, and you begin to see how God had compassion over this guy. The Bible actually records Abraham as a father of faith. It says that he had great faith in God. If you're kind of new to this whole thing, some of you guys aren't new, but if you're new to this journey with Jesus and the whole Bible, whenever you, you hear that God says you're a man of great faith, it brings so much comfort to me. You know why? Abraham was a cheater. He was a liar. He didn't have faith when he started. Like, dude, dude got involved with all kinds of, like, some crazy witchcraft stuff in his earlier years. And the, the, the family that he came from was not a godly family. They would build idols and different things. And God pulls him away from that. And he starts, and he starts acting obedient. But when he started his journey with God, he was pretty immature. And he's a great example for all of us that God doesn't select perfect and mature people. He looks for fragile vessels that need God. He says, you know what? I'm going to call you to be a great person. And he pulls us out of our condition and gingerly begins to form us and make us into the image of his son, Jesus, who is perfect. God is patient. Does anybody here ever screw up from time to time? <laughs> Only four of us make mistakes. <laughs> Any Raider fans? In the, no, anyways, anyways. Um, God finds earthen vessels such as us, and he begins to do a work of regeneration in us. And he continues to do this transformation from the inside out. Abraham, when he started, he didn't have faith at all. He had very little faith. A couple of times, a couple of times, not just once, but a couple of times, I guess he was married to a hottie. <laughs> Sarah was a cutie. But they couldn't have kids. But they go into this one town, and the king's like, dang, Abe, who that girl? Is that from your church right there? Who is she? Oh. And it says that he feared for his life. So rather than telling the king that that's his girl, that they've been married, oh, that's my sister in the Lord. You feel me? It's like, that's my sister. And he lies. And, and the guy is like, that's great. She's a free agent. Cool. I'm going to invite her out to dinner one of these nights. And uh, that night, God has to actually speak to the king through a dream like she ain't his sister. He's married to her. He's like, what? She's a hottie. You know, and twice Abraham does that. And yet the Bible records him as being a man of great faith. So there's hope for all of us. He made some boneheaded moves, and yet God was gracious. He was patient. And he grew in his faith to the point where later on, when he became more seasoned, he didn't have any kids. God says, I'm going to give you a son. And not only am I going to give you a son, I'm going to change your name. I'm going to call you a father of multitudes. He says, God, but I, we don't, Sarah and I, I mean, she's cute and all that, but we don't even have one kid. How am I going to be a daddy to multitudes? God says, look at the sky. Count the stars. That's going to be your inheritance. He's like, okay. And he began to grow in his faith. One day, God would bless him with his own biological son. 
for that matter, he had more than one son. He had one. He tried to help God out by like, okay, Sarah, like she's beautiful. Now we're not having kids, so let me like have a baby with this other girl. And that wasn't God's destiny for him. Eventually, God will bless him, and Sarah would have a son by the name of Isaac. When Isaac was older, one day God says, all right, you love me, right? Why don't you offer him up as a sacrifice? Dang, CPS would be all over Abraham back in the day. Like, say what? You want to offer him as a sacrifice? You crazy. I'm going to shut this down. But Abraham, he was willing to trust God, and he goes to worship God, and he's willing to literally kill his son, his only son at this time. And then God says, stop. I see that you're faithful. I see that you're obedient to my word. I said, I will, God says, I will provide myself a sacrifice. And we see the, the progression of how Abraham grew in his faith. Faith grows for all of us. Amen. Here, Paul talks now a couple thousand years later, and he says to these people, he says, now, you, you are heirs of Abraham. The promises that God made to Abraham, they apply to you as well. And you go, what are the promises he made to Abraham? This is what God says, and it starts in Genesis 12. I'll read one or two verses only, and you can explore this later on your own. Genesis 12, verse 2, it says, God speaking to, Mo, to uh, Abraham, he says, And I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others, and I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those who tr uh, treat you with contempt. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. So basically God says, you know what, Abraham, I love you so much, dude. I'm going to take a high-def picture portrait of you and i'm going to put it on my refrigerator that's how much i love you and i'm going to bless you so much you won't even be able to understand how much i'm going to bless you and anyone who blesses you they too will be blessed anyone who curses you they're going to deal with my consequences because you're favorite of me god so all of a sudden abraham finds his place where like he is favorite of god he is blessed of god and then god says i, I will bless you that you might be a blessing to others that you that all the families of the earth would be blessed here's the principle that we learn when God blesses us, he blesses us with a purpose. The blessings of God aren't just for ourselves. He pours blessings into us so that we can pour blessings out to others. As you receive from God, we also choose to give out to others. He blesses people through us. Turn to the person next and say, God blesses people through us. Very good, very good, very good. You are meant to be blessed so that you might be a blessing unto others. When I was a kid, I used to um, love playing soccer. I played soccer every day. As, as the sun would go down, that was the time that I was called to go home. So from morning to, like, dusk, from morning to late afternoon, all of a, I, I'd, I'd be on the streets playing ball, and that's just the way I grew up. And you can see I'm extremely athletic, you know. And um, One of my, my fun things to do was, was play with my friends from church. So um, we would jump and take public transportation. We didn't have Uber or Lyft back in the day. So on Saturday mornings, I'd get up, and I would take two, sometimes three buses to get to the other side of the city called Curitiba. All my Brazilian friends would know what that is, Curitiba. Three buses to get there because I was determined I got to play ball with my homies from church. <laughs> and I was 11 or 12 years old, and I'd do this, and we would play for hours. I spent all my money just getting there and then money to get back, so I didn't have money to go buy water or anything. So you know what us poor kids would do? We would go find someone's lawn and find a hose. And like, you know what, I'm thirsty. Cl crawl over and turn the water on and just drink water from the their hose. So this one Saturday, I remember this vividly. We played for hours. I'm just beet red. I'm just dying. I'm melting. I'm dying. And I'm looking for water. And Portuguese would say, agua. Cadê agua? Where's my agua? And I'm looking for agua. And I see a hose over there by, by the side of this house. And I run over there and I turn the spigot thing on. And I, I go to the other side and start, come on, water. It's a hot day. The water isn't coming out. Man, what's going on? And I'm desperate. I'm just like, I'm so thirsty. I'm going to eat this hose. You know, I'm, and then I see there's a kink in the hose right over there. I'm like, I'm going to go fix that. I, as soon as I undid that kink in the hose, all of a sudden water began to flow out. I made a mistake. Rather than allowing the water to flow for about 30 seconds to get all of that stagnant water that had been sitting there for maybe days or months, the sun was just baking on that water. I was thirsty. I ran to the hose, and I grabbed the tip of it. I started drinking this warm water. It's warm, nasty. It tastes like rubber. And, oh, and as I'm drinking, all of a sudden, something gets stuck on my tooth. I pull it out, and it's still alive. It's a spider that had crawled into the hose little babies and whatnot, and the spider. And I'm like, I was so thirsty. I was like, <laughs> spitting up this warm water, ugh, gagging and stuff. This is nasty. 
And yet to me, that's a picture of how Christians, when they don't have an outlet, come on somebody, when they receive from God and then they just kind of stew there in their own lives. They've been blessed by God. They have access to the source, but they don't choose to release that blessing through them. They pretty soon become stale and warm. The Bible says that don't be a lukewarm kind of person because you're, you're just going to cause God to throw up. You're nasty to God. It's like that's not, it's not a good thing. And, and critters and different things grow in people's lives when there's not an outflow. Come on, somebody. So the analogy is don't, don't call the person next to you a hoe. It's like we're a hose, a hose. We're a hose that God can flow through. All right, somebody. Someone came to church today, like, what kind of preacher is that? God wants to flow in and through us. All right, somebody. We've been blessed to be a blessing. Tell that person next to you one more time. We've been blessed to be a blessing. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, Jesus here. He begins to preach a, a sermon longer than Pastor Marquis. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And he preaches, and it, it goes on for all day. And Jesus talk, it talks about a variety of different topics. But in, in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, he's talking to the people and says, listen, you're, you're called to be the salt of the world. You've got to bring some flavor. Wherever you go, you've got to bring some flavor. If you don't bring some flavor and people don't know what you're about, what your convictions are, you're not being an agent of heaven. And then he, he picks up from verse 14, and I'll read from the MSG version. He says, you're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think that I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open the house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to, open with God, to be open uh, with God, this generous Father in heaven. What's he saying here? Don't be a secret agent. As God has extended kindness to you, let his love and let his kindness shine through you. Everywhere you go, it should become very obvious. These people, they obviously are different from us. They have a relationship with God. There's something different about this guy. Chef, your food is delicious. Man, there's just something different about you, man. What's, what's different about you? What school did you go to? Who do you hang with? The Bible, by the way, says that that your mouth will speak whatever your heart is full of. Your mouth gives it away. <laughs> Some of you all, you know, like, this, is, this is like the highlight of the message right here. Your mouth will give it away. The Bible even says this, even a fool seems wise when he doesn't talk. <laughs> but the mouth will speak what the heart is full of. If you're saying poop all the time, poop this and poop that, I don't get poop. That means your heart is full of what? Your mouth gives it away. What's the condition of your heart? Who you hang out with will rub off on you. When you hang out with people, and I, I had an intern years ago. He was from the South, y'all. He was from the South. And he said, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Drank sweet tea. And he's from the South. God bless y'all. And next thing you know, these white people from the suburbs start talking like this dude from the South. And we're all saying, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, sir. And it rubbed off. And it's like just ha hanging out with this guy for a few months. His name is Jeremy. All of a sudden, Jeremy Reynolds got on us. Whenever you hang out with God, his nature, his character, his flavor gets on you. You hang out with them, and you can't help but talk like God, walk like God, act like God. It's like, man, there's a flavor of heaven that is displayed. Jesus is saying, listen, let your light so shine to everyone that they will see the glory of the Father and glorify him. That's what he's saying. But yet the church has played the great game of being secret agents. We come and we huddle. We have some great services and sing great songs and have great prayer meetings. But then we go out there. Ooh, the big bad world. And people don't even know that we're saved sometimes. We act just like the world. Is that cool? That ain't cool. That's not good at all. That's, that's what Jesus is saying. Don't be like that. So we're talking about making a difference. How then do we make a difference? I'm asking you that question. I'm going to give you seven ideas. There's, there's more ways, but these are seven great ones. How can I make a difference in life that will really count? A lot of y'all are making memories, but you're not leaving a mark. A lot of y'all, you post on social media, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, taking pictures with this person. It's like, man. Last night watching the fight. Like, man, it's about to happen. We're posting it going live. Like, oh, man, it's going down. 
we're creating memories, but are we making a difference? Are we leaving a mark, a tangible mark in people's lives where even when our lives have passed and we're far gone, people will still remember because of this person's faithfulness, it changed my life. Because of that person's boldness or their courage or their obedience, my life was so greatly impacted. Today I serve the Lord because of that. Are we creating memories or are we purposely making marks? That's what we're talking about. How do we make a difference? Number one, here's the first thought. you got to live for the bigger picture. We have to see life through God's lenses. Life is much bigger than just getting up in the morning, sipping some coffee, and trying to get through another day. Like, man, if the 49ers would just start playing better, man, life would be so much better. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Fantasy football coming up. Dun, 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 dun. Life is much more than just winning a match, winning a game. Life is much, much more than just going and trying to think of the next place to eat. It's like, oh, we got eat-ups at church now. I wonder where the crew is going to go eat today. What kind of food are we going to have? Life is much more than that. And yet so many of us are consumed with just the immediate needs that are right in front of us. And we don't see life through the big picture. Here's the big picture. The reality is this. There are seven plus billion people walking on the, on the face of the earth. Every second someone is dying. And if they don't know God, they're going to spend eternity distant from God. Hell. And it, once, once you go to hell, there's no turning back. When people die, there's no turning back to come into this dimension. The big picture is this. God has commissioned us. He's granted us the privilege of partnering with him to be those who would share the good news. That is, people, you can connect to God. God loves you. He forgives you of all of, all of your sins as he's forgiven all of my sins. We're called to be agents of God to share compassion with others. That's the big picture. People are going to do what's wrong. The government is going to act crazy. The economy is going to be stupid. 49ers will, won't suffer too much longer, Lord willing. But life is much bigger than all these things. And especially the older we become, the more we realize, man, time flies by. We wake up and it's like, man, it's 2017. You blink, it's 2018. How do we get here? The other day, instinctively, I was swimming. I come out of the water and I go like this. <laughs> Just come out. Like, what is this for? Back when I had hair, wavy. And it's stick back there. And then I realized I've been bald for over 10 years already. What's going on? What's going on here? You blink and you've lost your hair. I mean, you blink and it's like time has gone by. What's the big picture? God has a big picture and he sees life. Life is just very quick. The Bible says that life is like a vapor. You're here and then you're gone. We have a moment in history to make a difference now. And we shouldn't wait until our latter years to try to start making a difference. We start now. See life through the big picture. The reality is this. We should be on mission 24-7. You shouldn't only be on mission when you come to church on Sunday. You shouldn't just be on mission when you're on Mission Street in the Mission District. You're on mission 24-7. Sorry for the cheesy joke. That was stupid. Moving on. The second thought, how do we make a difference? Number two, develop and use your unique gifts and talents. God has given to all of us unique abilities, natural abilities and talents, spiritual gifts. God's given us all different things. The Bible says in Psalms that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. Some of us more fearfully than wonderful. Well, who am I pointing at, Keys? No, I'm just messing with you. So we are fearfully and wonderfully made. God sprinkled a little bit of this in you, a little bit of that in you. Girl, the other day, I didn't know you. You came here and you were in the worship service and all of a sudden this prophetic thing kicked in. I had no idea what you did connected with Spotify and the arts and music and all that. All I heard was God saying, you got a great plan for her. And I began to prophesy over you worship and music and creativity and leadership. These are things that God has placed within you. It wasn't something that you just kind of came up, you know, came up with on your own or that someone else coached you with. God gave you those talents, but now it's your job to develop those things. Amen, somebody? We develop the gifts that God has placed within us. My wife and I decided to take our daughters to Thailand in November. So we're going with Peter and Chinga and a few others to go minister to just some wonderful people there. Chinga said, hey, uh, your daughters, do they worship? I go, yeah, they worship, of course. Like, can they lead worship? I'm like, I'll stop for sure. Yeah. Go home. Girls, grab your guitars quick. Dust off the dust. Start playing. How do we play? No, don't hold it like that. Hold it like over here. Now hold those. <laughs> I'm being facetious. But they began to, they've been playing for like weeks now. And they got like callous. I'm like, Dad, don't touch my hand. They're like all oh, callous because they've been practicing for hours. And, and just this weekend, I went to listen to them play. I'm like, huh. They began, they were, they were playing the guitar. It was 
it, it was tuned. It was, they were singing on key. They were worshiping God. I'm like, how did that happen? Obviously, you hung out with your mom. They've been developing that gift. And God's given all of us gifts, talents, abilities. It's our responsibility to say yes to those things, but then develop them and then use them to influence and make a difference in other people's lives. Can I get a loud amen for that one right there? You might say, I'm, a, I'm not a very talented person. Let's, let's, let's think positive. You're still breathing. Good job. You are a winner. When mom and dad went on a date, romance happened. You were the consequence or the result of that. That means you already are a winner from day one. You won. You beat millions of other little seeds, and you're a champion. You got some good things going for you. And some of you are like, oh, that's awkward in church. Just wait till we launch our new series next week, talking about relationships. It's going to be so good. We're talking, call, calling it crazy makers because some people drive you crazy, and you might be crazy about them. But we're going to talk about relationships and singleness and friendship and how to find the right person for you. If you're married, we'll be praying for you. And now, but we're going to talk about friendships and how to have healthy biblical relationships with people, both church and unchurched. We're going to talk about conflict resolution. When someone's been hating on you and they're throwing shade all over you, it's like, how, how do you deal with that? What is the proper approach? We're going to talk about that for the next seven weeks. Different ones of us are going to be coming up and helping. So, but that's starting next week. Develop your gifts and, and your talents and be the best you that God's called you to be. Amen, somebody? Third thought very quickly, how to make a difference. Seize every opportunity and serve others. Opportunities are going to come your way. Take advantage of them. Don't take advantage of people. Take advantage of, uh, of opportunities. Opportunities, someone said they come and they what? They're always knocking. There's always opportunities for you to be a blessing unto others. You just have to seize that opportunity. And as God sees it, he uses it. Pastor Keys this week, for example, one, one of the ministries that we partner with, the Epiphany House, it's, it's like a, a beautiful home for women, uh, single moms and whatnot. They're, they're recovering from different things. We've, we've loved on the, the, the folks there and helped them before. And they said, man, we've got a garden that just needs some help. Like, but you know, Pastor Marquise, he's got a great, great green thumb. And he's like, I can recruit some people. We're going to come and we're going to work on their garden. And by the way, if you have a desire to help with the garden project, talk to Pastor Keys. They don't grow weed over there. <laughs> they, they grow tomatoes and a bunch of other stuff. I'm throwing all kinds of shade your way, man. I love you, though. You're amazing. <laughs> but if you want to help grow some stuff there and clean their garden, I mean, the opportunity came. We weren't looking for that, but it made itself available. Let's seize these opportunities. Let's love some people. God, by the way, gave us a brand new van. Not brand new, but, but a new van to us. A very nice van. Not them old vans from the 70s, those weird, you know, freaky ones. A brand, like a very nice, nice van, 12-passenger van. It's, it's amazing. I'm like, why would God give us that van? Maybe because there's some people that need to be driven to, to one place to the other. And maybe we use this van, Beth, to go pick up some, some of these gals from, from the recovery house and bring them to church on Sundays and let them meet the family of God here. That's a cool idea. Whatever. I'm just throwing out some ideas. Opportunities come. We've got to seize them. Both in the house of the Lord. You saw a wonderful dream team of workers right here that serve our children. Children might be the leaders of tomorrow, but they're the treasures of right now. It's like, man, and we got a lot of kids. like, man, I beseech you. On behalf of God's mercies, come and join the children's ministry of our City Life Church. And, uh, um, but there's so many great ways that you can serve, serve one another here in the house, but not just here, in our communities, in the workplace. Look for ways that you can make a difference in someone's life. Or maybe a mission trip. We're going to Thailand. We've got teams. We want to send teams to all kinds of different places, as we have already. But maybe God will allow you to travel. Carla, lead that team and send a team to wherever and, like, go for a, a week and just bless people with the good news of Jesus. God doesn't look for superstars. He looks for available vessels. You don't have to become all that and a bag of chips to make a difference. Just make yourself available. God can work with that. Come on, somebody. That's a good point right there. Amen, somebody. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Number four, start where you are, where you are, and do whatever you can. Start where you're at right now. Like, man, I'm busy. I got work. I've got kids. I've got all kinds of different things. Ask God, Lord, how can I make a difference in someone's life? Maybe you're a stay-at-home mom or parent, and you don't have a whole lot of time to go out there. Do you have a phone? Do you have a, a, a computer, maybe? Maybe God's giving you the, the, the gift of encouragement. Maybe pray and ask God to place a couple people in, in, in your heart 
say, so you know what, I'm going to send them just a quick little message just to encourage them, maybe a verse. And all of a sudden, as you're thinking of that person, you don't have to be all like spiritually fancy and use all those spiritual words, but maybe just the thought, say, hey, I was thinking about you today and just kind of on my heart, I just want to let you know how, how incredible you are. And I'm reminded that one time and brag on them for just a split second and just say, hey, I'm, I'm praying for you today. Hope you have a great day. Do you know that that pick me up kind of blessing can change someone's life? Some people, all it takes is just one word of encouragement. There's one person that came a while back to our church, and they parked in front of the church here on 6th Street. They hadn't been to church in a while. And they're like, man, I've never been to City Life. Their website's pretty cool. And, but, like, the whole church thing, again, I kind of feel out of place. And I don't know if I'm going to fit in, if I'm going to know how to do what they do. And sing those songs, and they're probably going to try to take some of my money. It's like, man, what do I do? And so they were parked on 6th Street, and they tuned in to start watching this online. And they're watching the service on their phone, but afraid to come into the building. One of our greeters happens to be on the sidewalk just waving, holding a sign, hey, you can sit with me, or whatever the sign was. You know, they're just waving at people. And they noticed the person sitting in their car, and that person had, a, had made eye contact with them a few times. So eventually they, they go, you know what, I'm just going to go say hi. They walk over there, hi, hi, how you doing, how's your Sunday going? And the person rolled down the window, good. Hey, we're having a church service right now. It's, it's super chill. Love to have you come if you've got not, nothing going on. I'm, I know you're busy on your phone, but love to have you come. If, oh, okay. And that person came. That day they came. They returned their heart. They, they, they got connected to God again. They committed their life to Jesus again. Why? Because someone had the courage. They looked at the opportunity. They did something about it. They went and just said, hello. Hello, it's me. <laughs> You don't have to preach at them, but be used of God. Look at these opportunities. Start where you're at and watch what God can do. Amen, somebody? Number five, follow your passions and look for God to open new doors. God has placed a passion within different ones of us. Some of us have passions for certain things. Like some of, the, some of these, like Harana was telling me a while ago, some of the stuff, the, the stand-up stuff in the Bayview that you guys do, Terrell. That's amazing. That's about, if, if a white boy like me try to go and rhyme like that and start talking and like, you know, doing stuff, I, I wouldn't even know where to start. I wouldn't even know how to, how, to, how to organize something like this. But it's a passion that drives, and therefore, I know it costs money to do it, but, man, you provide a place for artists to come and to connect and, 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 and ex, you know, express their talents and their gifts. That's amazing. You can work with that right there. It's different for all of us. What are your passions? What are the things that you're intrigued with? Maybe it's gardening. Talk to Pastor Keys, and the opportunity will, will be blessed. And uh, <laughs> So follow your passions and look for God to open new doors for you. The Bible says that God will make a way. He'll open a door that no man can shut. When God opens doors, it doesn't matter what people try to do. You're going to be able to walk right through it. Is that, is that a good word right there? Here's the key that's important. Learn to recognize the voice of God in every season. Because God sometimes will open a, a door wide open for you. And sometimes you're not hearing his voice and you're questioning, is this of God or not? Learn to hear the voice of God. Hear his voice. It's always consistent with his word. Proceed. When he gives you that green light, walk through that door. Do what you got to do. He's with you. Finally, number six, allow God to use your trials and your setbacks to inspire others. None of us like trials. We just started our, our new life group this last week, and it's been amazing. Francis Chan and, and the book of James, that's what we're exploring for the next several weeks. All throughout San Francisco and the Bay Area, we're meeting in small groups, and we're learning from the book of James. James chapter 1, verse 2, it says this. Consider it pure joy when you experience struggles or when you face trials of many kinds. You're like, say what, Brother James? Consider pure joy when you experience all these trials and hardships. He goes on to say, because that's going to develop perseverance in you, and it's going to cause you to become mature in the things of God, not lacking anything. Maybe you're going through a hell season right now, and it's not fun. You didn't sign up for it. You didn't ask for it. It, it's like you didn't go to that seminar to go join hell, but hell came and found you. It's like the UPS truck delivered hell to you, rang the doorbell, you opened it up, bah, you're experiencing it right now. How did that happen? You weren't looking for trouble, trouble found you. The reality is this, life happens, and with life, trials, tribulations, tests, they're going to come your way. The question is this, can you see the redemptive value of God through that process? Can you embrace the blessings that can come from that experience? It's not fun. It's never fun. Never enjoyable. But God, if you allow God to use that to strengthen you, 
It's all about your response, by the way, how you respond to God through this process, through this season. As you respond to God, God draws you closer to Him. As you embrace God, sometimes it's like, man, you didn't ask for this, but through it all, it caused you to be driven towards God, and you found that your prayer life increased. You had become maybe a little complacent in your walk with God, but through this difficult season, it brought you to your knees where you had to cry out to God, and all of a sudden, things came back into perspective. Embrace the test. And be sure to get the blessing that comes with it. If you try to take a detour and you try to like slip away from this test and do things and handle things in a way that isn't consistent with the heart of God, guess what? You're going to have to take the test again. And I hate do-overs. Anybody enjoy do-overs? It's like you didn't pass the DMV test. It was hard just getting that darn appointment. And then you didn't pass the test. That means you're going to have to stare at that appointment again and endure those long lines. And then you have to take the test again. So... Do what you got to do to pass this test and receive the blessing that comes from, from that test. And then look at this. Through your struggles and through your hard or difficult seasons, now those scars, those bruises that you've incurred, they actually become a platform or a pulpit that you can preach from now. Why? Because you've been there, done that. Maybe you made some poor choices. Has anyone ever made some poor choices? I've made many. I continue to make poor choices. Maybe some of the storms that you've experienced were because of maybe lack of good wisdom on your part, and therefore you find yourself in this tough season. Well, now that you've learned from this life experience, share with others and keep them from making those boneheaded moves themselves. Or maybe, maybe life happened, you didn't ask for this trouble, you had to go through it, you were a victim of something, but now you do have a testimony, use it to encourage others. Maybe they're in that place now or on the, the verge of being at that place. Allow God to use your scars to encourage and to inspire others. That's the point. My boy Oscar, he's, he attended the first service and he's serving now. He shared at our West Campus at SF State last fall a beautiful spoken word piece that he, he shared with all of us and inspired many of us. He talked about his journey, how he was an alcoholic. The alcohol was driving him to the point that one day he woke up and uh, uh, law enforcement had, had taken him in and he lost custody of his son because he wasn't in that place, right right state of mind, to be able to father his son, Diego. And the world just came crashing down on him, and he shares how he turned to God, and he, he, he wept, and he, he's like, God, I need you to change me. And God, in his mercy, spared Oscar, changed him, set him free from alcohol, returned Diego to him. Now he, Diego gets to have a dad, and, and Oscar was sharing through that piece how he didn't have a dad. His dad was, was killed at a, at a young age, and he didn't have a father figure. But now he gets to be a father figure to, to his own son. He gets to be that person. Now from his tragedy, from his scars, he has a platform to encourage others. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful with what the world's going to try to ensnare you with. And perhaps you find yourself in that place. Guess what? Cry out to God. And he is an inspiration. And I could go down the list looking at different ones of you guys, how you have stories. Your hardship has become your platform. Use it to inspire others and make a difference. Amen, somebody? Finally, finally, number seven, build a life that will leave a legacy. Build a life. Live a life that will leave a legacy, a legacy that will outrun you, a legacy that will outlast you. If you're doing this thing called life, just so that you can check in and find it someday, make it to heaven. <laughs> I made it, God. <laughs> if that's what you're living for, that's not enough. Your mission in life is to make a difference and to affect as many people as possible. If you're a parent, your mission is to set up the next generation, your kids, to outrun you. My boys, we were having, we were having real talk, guy talk the other day in the room. And I said, look, man, I was telling the boys, I said, I've, dad's had some incredible experiences. We've been able to, mom and daddy, to see many miracles happen. Churches planted, missions. I mean, we've seen all kinds of things. But I said, the most important mission and ministry that I have it's to help you boys become the, the great and mighty warriors that God's called you to be. One of my sons says, that's right, Dad. I'm going to play for the warriors, and then someday I'll be a preacher. <laughs> I said, as long as you tithe, that's cool with me, son. <laughs> but you're mighty men of God. My job is to set you up. That's why they memorize verses. They're, 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 they're jotting down. I was at the men's camp, and my wife sent the pictures like, your sons are getting it. Memorizing verses at a young age. They're getting the word of God. Why? Because God's called them to be messengers of good news. And we're not going to wait till they're 18 to learn the Bible. They're learning it right now. I take responsibility for my sons. I teach them at home. Here at Kids Church, we don't babysit kids. They're being trained in the things of God right here. We take this serious. My job is to see them outrun dad. My youngest son one day said, Dad, 
Someday I'm going to be a way better preacher than you. Oh, that's, I said, that's for sure. For sure. I said, you will. Because my church is going to be way bigger than your church, Dad. Really? How big? Three million. All right, come on. Childlike faith. Have a three million. Impact people's lives. That's the goal. Make a difference. Would you stand to your feet and allow me to pray for you today? <laughs> make a difference. We're not here to just coast through life. God wants to use us to make a difference. Jesus talking to his disciples right towards the end of the book of Matthew. He says, you want to be great? You want to be amazing? You want to be a great leader? And he's exhorting them and prepping them up and challenging them because Jesus was about to birth the church. The church didn't exist prior to that. He's raising up these disciples. Some of them were some knuckleheads, doubters. One dude was going to tap out and call it quits before he was launched into ministry, Judas. He's talking to these guys and he says, you want to be great? You want to have great influence? He says, become a servant. Become a servant of all. And Jesus himself, the son of God, says, I'm going to set the example. And in their culture, it was common for a servant to come and wash people's feet. They've been walking with flip-flops, sandals, whatever. Dirty, dusty feet. You come into the house. You're going to come and lean on the table. The table wasn't something that you would sit up on, like a bar, a table. And it was something that was actually low. So feet and dirt, it's like they didn't, that, that didn't work. What does Jesus do? They're about to have a meeting, a meal, and he grabs a towel and he begins to wash the feet of his servants, or of his disciples, excuse me. And they're like, what are you doing? You're the leader. And he says, exactly. Exactly. You want to lead? You want to make a difference? Learn to serve others. Learn to serve. Leaders aren't just people that are on a platform. Leaders are people that make a difference every day of the week. Be a great parent. If you have kids, be a great parent. Not a perfect parent, a great parent. A great parent will acknowledge their mistakes. I had to re repent to one of my daughters. It happens about every two years I'll make a mistake. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I had to repent to one of my daughters. I said, babe, I'm sorry. I was immature of dad. My bad. And you know what? I think that probably actually impressed her more than any, any sermon that I would preach from up here. The dad would actually acknowledge and recognize I made a mistake. It took the Holy Spirit and Elena to, to show that to me. Be a servant. Be an example. Choose to make a difference. As you serve others, you'll impact them for the glory of God. Allow me to pray for us real quick. <clears throat> God, thank you. Thank you for the reminder of your faithfulness towards us. You're so good. You're so compassionate towards us. You're so amazing. God, what a joy it is to, to get to know you, to know God, not just about God, but to know God. What an awesome privilege that we have to experience freedom. God, we're, we're set free. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. Thank you for the freedom that you make available to us. God, I thank you that we get to discover our purpose in life. God, you've got a great plan for all of our lives, even with our detours that we've taken some of our setbacks, perhaps some of the, the exits that we took. And yeah, God, you still have a great plan for our lives. Thank you for revealing that to us. And Lord, thank you for the reminder today that you want us to make a difference. Lord, we don't want to just live for ourselves. We want to live Im to impact lives around us. So God, we say, if you can use anything, God, use us. Would you say that with me? Say, God, if you can use anything, use me. I open my heart. I open my hands. I open my life to be a conduit of your blessings. Use me, God, to bless others in the name of Jesus. Now, the final prayer for today, probably my favorite prayer of the week, is helping people that are distant from God be connected to God again. I don't know your story. I probably don't even know your name, any of you, but God knows you. He knows your name. He knows everything about you, and he's madly in love with you. Maybe you found yourself today in this place, and you go, man, I'm not right with God. I need to get right with God. Maybe one of two scenarios has played out in your life. One, maybe you've never given him an opportunity to be the designated driver in your life. Maybe you've called the shots all along, all by yourself, and you go, man, I need God to intervene. I need him to be the one in control. Maybe that's your story today. Or perhaps another scenario, Maybe at some point you did invite God, and you were, you were pursuing the things of God, but life happened, stuff happened, and today all of a sudden you find yourself distant from God, and He's no longer the one that's been the Lord of your life. You've been the Lord of your life. 
and you're saying, man, I don't want to live like this any longer. I want to get right with God. The Bible says, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. That invitation is available to all of us today. I'm going to lead us in this prayer. All of us are going to pray together. But if you're here today and say, you know what? I need to get right with God. One of those scenarios are your, your, your story. I believe God's going to hear your prayer. And he's going to introduce you to a brand new chapter of your journey with him. Can we pray this prayer together? Say, Jesus, thank you for loving me. Today I open my heart. I invite you into my life. Be the Lord of my life. I repent of doing things my way. I repent of my sins. I repent of my selfishness. I turn to you and I surrender to you. Jesus, thank you for giving me a new beginning, a fresh start. Help me now to live for you and to make a difference. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's tell the Lord how much we appreciate him. Amen. Hey, real quick. If you said that prayer, could you just raise your hand? If you said that prayer for the first time today, saying, I committed my life to Jesus today. I just want to acknowledge you. Amen. A couple of hands over here. Anybody else saying, I prayed that prayer today. Thank you, sis, in the back. Amen. Anybody else? A couple over there. Anybody else on this side over here? Congratulations, you guys. Proud of you guys. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week. Hey, as we conclude the service, we're going to have a few of our leaders. If you need anybody to pray with you about anything, a job, relationships, friend, whatever it would be, find one of us leaders. We'd love to pray for you. For the rest of us, have a wonderful week. God bless you guys. Enjoy that great weather. <laughs>